Welcome to Pop Turnative, where we dive into topical discussions from the worlds of pop culture, social media, and sports. Here is your host, Peter Ramoliotis, aka PD Beats. Hello and welcome to the Pop Turnative Podcast. This is the podcast where we have digital discussions from the worlds of TV. Film, pop culture, social media, everything really depending on the guest. We talk we ta- talk about it all. As always, I'm your host, Peter Miliotis. On Twitter and on social media, you know me as PD Beats. And my guest is an actress. You will recognize... Well, I don't know. Maybe uh, they, they, maybe they will recognize you because of all the <laughs> amazing makeup I just realized. But uh, my guest plays Soren in uh, Captain Marvel. We're with Sharon Blinn. Sharon, welcome to Pop Alternative. Uh, thanks for having me. No problem. Yeah, I caught myself there because maybe they would, maybe, maybe maybe they would recognize you with with, with the makeup. No, probably not because I'm <laughs> green with big pointy ears and weird graphical stuff on my head and purple, blue, full full contact lenses. Too. Absolutely. So, icebreaker question. I mean, you're part of the Marvel universe. How does it feel to be part of the Marvel universe? <laughs> like that. <laughs> I'm a total Marvel geek fan, like since childhood. So I, it's so funny. I was just talking about this last night because um, um, my sister's here from uh, out of town, and there was a, like a, a gathering of her some of her college friends, and it turns out one of them is also a Marvel fan. And when they found out I was in the movie, I was like, yeah, you might not recognize me from that. And then I showed them the picture, like. <gasps> So uh, we were all kicking out together, and we had we had all these mutual friends that were all fans too. So we just turned into a little bit of a Marvel fest for a few minutes. <laughs> is there any stories in regards to how you landed the role of Sora? I mean, it's an audition, right? But is there any kind yeah. of cool tidbits in regards to that? Um, well, it's just all around magical. Uh, the audition itself was that scene, uh, that main scene with no dialogue. So I had to create that whole thing without any words, uh, or being able to run up and hug anyone. You know, to, so so that was it was as an actor that was like one of those auditions that would usually be pretty terrifying because mm-hmm. it's all physicality and I don't know, you know. But I had just taken an audition technique class uh, called Acting Pros uh, with Wendy Davis and Lilac Mandelovich and. The first three weeks of that class were specifically the kinds of things I needed to know for that audition. So it was, it was kind of this kind of divine, magical, okay, you're going to take this class. And don't know why I was compelled to do that, but I did it. And then the, those first three lessons, I had the audition the, the, the week after, and they were everything like creating an eye line, what side of the room to walk in, how to, how to, create, how to create the environment with just your physicality and and also how to show something like a hug without actually hugging someone. So they were like the three critical things I needed to know for that audition. I, I, I often ask about kind of the misconceptions of the industry to my guests. Like, you know, what's the kind of audition process like or actually, you know, um, rehearsing? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny to me because... Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's also situations where, you know, you're doing a scene or they tell you something and then you get the role and then maybe there's been changes made and it's and, and what you prep, prep for wasn't what you kind of got yourself into. Yeah, it's sort of, you keep them, for me anyway, I, I keep them in two separate worlds. I mean, there, there's it's like a Venn diagram. There's some overlap in the yeah. middle because you do have to act in auditions. <laughs> but auditioning itself is, is almost a separate... Uh, medium in some ways um because they're they're not they're they're looking for a lot of different things that have nothing to do with what's going to happen on set um and some of it is even something as simple as are you directable so it may not even matter as much what you did in your preparation but if the casting director then gives you a redirect and it's totally different than what you spent the day if you have more than a day then the two two or three days preparing can you change it like that and so are you going to be easy to work with on set are you malleable can you you know what i mean so there's some things that are just very technical that when you're on set you can really dig down into the emotion and, the, and all that other kind of work and yes there are script changes all the time especially i think more probably in television than film um but with marvel it's a, a little bit closer to the television scene in, in, the, in terms of that script change because they keep everything very secret so I only got the pages that were related to me, like the day or two before, maybe the week before. But even up until and on set, I might 
come come into the trailer with pages on the table that have completely different situations. No, absolutely, and we'll talk about it a little bit a, a little bit after too. But there's also a very interesting end credit involving your character. Uh, really? Yes. And I have to say, when I when I saw that, I was like, "Oh my god!" Like I literally <laughs> said that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and no, but it's one of those things where you know. It's hit or miss sometimes with the end credits for those Marvel movies because sometimes you're expecting more, sometimes it's small, but this was significant. <laughs> and there was two, so a lot of people when they saw the first one with the J.K. Simmons, you know him coming in, you know Drudge, yeah. the Drudge Report parallel guy on the uh, on the teleprompter thing in Times Square. I don't, I don't, I don't give away, give anything away here. But well, anyway, no, 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 no. It's, it, it, come on, Far From. A lot of people have seen Far From Home. We'll say spoiler hopefully. alert, but hopefully, no, we're gonna talk about yeah, it. Yeah, don't say. Anything. Um, but yeah, so there was that that spoiler, and, and and that was so that was a huge drop too. Yeah. So I think people thought, oh well, how can it get any bigger and weirder than that? <laughs> so when I was in the movie theater, I was actually seeing some people kind of leave, and I was kind of like, you know, <laughs> there's one, <laughs> there's one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stay <laughs> don't leave <laughs> well it's funny though because now everything like like on reddit people let like are letting people know right so because like we just saw like i went to go see like the joker and there are people that were waiting at the end and i'm like no there's no end credit like, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like there's there's no end credit but uh it's it's interesting because they're calling captain marvel a groundbreaking film Yes. What has the reception been from your perspective about being from this groundbreaking film of Captain Marvel? I think what's interesting is that, of course, being the first female-led superhero in the MCU, um, that's been that you know. Then behind the scenes, uh, uh, Anna Boden being the first female director in the MCU, and I think also the storyline. You know, in terms of groundbreaking, those are the two biggest things as far as I understand it. Um, in terms of the storyline and, and some of the messaging in it, I don't know if it's groundbreaking in, in a certain sense because Marvel's always done uh, social and political commentary in various ways because um, that's you know what they've always done and and there are always these nuanced characters where you it's not just this black and white dichotomy of you know good all good all evil you know there's always uh, some kind of uh, empathy and given to where the supposed villains come from. Like even Thanos, you know, his story is incredible. And it was one of the most amazing scenes in, in the, the first, uh, the Infinity War, you know, mm -hmm. just, you're just looking at what he's saying in his comment about how humans are destroying the earth. And, and, and you know, and, you know, his love for the planet and it's, you know, whatever. And him, him having this twisted way of trying to save the planet by killing half the people in it. It's like intellectually, you're like, yeah, we are destroying the earth, but uh, I don't think you should kill all those people. But you know what I mean? It's like this, it makes you think. And that's one of the things that I've always loved about Marvel. It just, it, it, the, the writing has always been so strong and making you think about the world around you and who we call evil and where is that coming from? Where's that idea even coming from? And maybe we should kind of look black and look back and look inside ourselves, you know? You know, there's all this talk right now of all these streaming services coming out and people kind of staying at home and watching all this content. And that's fantastic. You know what I mean? I'm one of them that, you know, binges all these shows. But there is something about going to a movie theater with your I friends. I love going to movies. I love I don't that. think it's going to stop. I don't think so either. And there's some movies, there's some movies that it's just, you know, you have that conversation in, in yourself. You're like... Do, do I need to see this on the big screen? Do I need that, you know, whole movie experience for this movie? You, you do kind of do that. So it's a little bit, sometimes there is a little like, ah, how does that work on TV? Plus you can have these huge entertainment systems at home, but it's, it's really never the same. Plus, you know, the graduated seating and the popcorn and the, you know, I don't know. It's just, I just I love going to a late night movie in my sweatpants yeah. and my hoodie and with my yeah. popcorn. It's like cozy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and it's, it's it's an experience, and it's it's also a social thing if you're doing it with friends, like you were saying. So, and and I think it's important for people to get out of their house, even if we're going from the house into another dark space to watch something. 
But having that communal group experience, that also, especially for movies like Marvel movies or other films that have like huge fan bases where, you know, there's cheering along, there's there's like this, it's like it's like going to a sporting event. It's yeah. you know, so you have that camaraderie and everyone's having this experience together and it's you know, movies bring people together. So um, I think it's important to keep that tradition going. Absolutely. So we talked about Cat Marvel, we talked about movies, and now we're going to talk about Bald is Beautiful. <laughs> which is also your Instagram handle, correct? Yes, there's a couple of dots in there. Yes, Bald, bald, bald dot. dot is Dot Beautiful, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, um, I like it, it says it on your, you know, your bio. You know, a, ca- a cancer activist, and you know, bald is beautiful is something that you've been doing. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, yes, I'm, I actually call myself an activist. Ah. Uh, yes, because I started acting only because I started bald is beautiful. I'm I'm an ovarian cancer survivor. Um, this month will be about sixteen and a half years out of the uh, out of that phase. <laughs> Um, and I had really long hair and it was part of my trademark, kind of my look, my hippie jazz chick. I worked in the jazz biz in, in New York city and it was part of my thing. It was a huge part of my identity or so I thought. And when I went through treatment and chemo, I realized, okay, well, I don't want to die. And oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my hair. Literally in that order, those two consecutive thoughts when I was told that this is what was going on. Um, I, I felt like I wanted to do something to change that. I was kind of, as as a sort of a long time, you know, feminist, I don't know, sometimes people think that's like a bad word, but you know, I'm a feminist, I'm a humanist and a feminist, but I was a little bit mad at myself for being so attached to my hair in that way when it was gonna go. So I just, okay. And then I met women who had a harder time losing their hair than even having cancer. And then that really tripped me out. Like that's just something so wrong with that. So I decided I wanted to do something somehow using the visual media to change. I, there's so much power in, the, in the TV, film, print, media, everything to change our perception of ourselves and, and even of the cancer experience. And I just felt like, and also I was young, I was 28 at the time. And I just felt like, you know, I don't, I don't see myself in any of this, the regular mainstream marketing, but also even in things that are depicting the cancer experience, they're all older than me. They all look like they're about to keel over. And I never looked or felt that way. So as a young person, it really reinforced this. I'm too young for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so I said, you know, I feel like if there's more images out there that kind of have a positive, empowering message, even if I'm playing a cancer patient, I want to try to convey something of strength even, you know. So it was just this idea festering in my head of like, okay, when I finish with the cancer thing, I want to start working in the television film genre to uh, make some change. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Because it's, uh, no, it's, it, it's, it, it's, I, I find it's a lot about, you know, people's, you know, have like, they go through things in life, past experiences, and then you hear, like, I just, this fascinating, all these stories, how, about how they've kind of dealt with that and how they've kind of used that is, is, yeah. is, is, is very, it's, it's very compelling. It's very interesting to hear too. Yeah, sometimes I would read stories like, you know, I got in this car accident and I nearly died and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I would read them and be like, wow, that's amazing. And I have no idea how what that means. And then I went through this this life altering experience that I that had the same effect that I could have never imagined that I would be bald, be acting because I was a very behind the scenes, you know, in my music business days, I was sort of like, don't look at me. I'm, I'm making, I'm promoting that person, you know, and that, uh, that artist and bringing great art to the world. That was my passion. That still is my passion. And then suddenly to be choosing to stay bald, which a lot of people didn't understand at first. And, you know, there's a lot of different things that gave me the courage to like, okay, I don't, I just don't want to have this be, Oh, that would have been a cool idea and not explore it. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the sort of the, I had this sense of urgency because of what I went through that, you know, life is short, it's fickle. And, don't put ideas and, and passions on the back burner in the name of safety or security or practicality. Like I had to go from practical to the passionate and no, abs- I, there's a sense of urgency about it. Uh, absolutely. What do you think? Cause you mentioned, I, I, I like that by the way, the activist. I like that. That's, activist. Yeah. That, that's good. What is your, you mentioned in the beginning about, you know, going in for the scenes and everything, but like, what is your favorite thing about, about acting and storytelling? Like, what do you like about it? Is there one thing that you could pick between a couple other things that stands out? Um, well, actually you said it, storytelling. Okay. I think 
storytelling is one of the most powerful things, especially when they're grounded in authentic stories. They are the connective tissue that tie all of humanity together from, you can be from any walk of life and something about someone's story is gonna connect us to each other. And so the idea of telling story, when I was in the music business, I was working with artists who were doing that through music. I was in the jazz biz, Verve Records, Blue Note Records, that kind of thing. Um, and they are constantly, that is what they're doing. They're telling story and they're, they're expressing themselves in this way that brings people together. And that's one of the things that I love about acting. I found my acting bug. I never acted before, but once I started doing it, and my twin sister is an actor and she'd been doing it for a long time and she kind of gave me the thumbs up. Uh, uh, she invited me to be part of a play that she put together. And, and she said, you know, she would have told me if I was like, you know, keep her day job. But she like, she said, yeah, do it. And it's one of those things, you know, and we were telling really powerful stories that were having this effect on people that you just don't know. You don't realize you, someone can do something, you can walk by someone on the street and say one thing and you just, that person just goes on with their life. But that thing, that, that interaction could have some kind of incredible ripple effect that you very rarely ever get to find out about. But with acting and music, you sometimes get this immediate feedback loop of, you know, this thing you did affected me in this way, not, maybe not positive. And hopefully if it's negative, it, it wakes you up and you have to be more conscious about how you engage with yourself and therefore with the world. And that's what storytelling has the power to do. Absolutely. I love it. Cause I, I, usually I start my, my questions with, you know, whether you're an actor, writer, musician, you're all storytellers. Yes. And, uh, but in this case, we, you answered the question at the end. Usually, you so that's great. Because I was going <laughs> to ask it regardless. But if you look at past episodes, that's kind of like one of my icebreaker questions. Was uh, But then I, I did that little mess up with the whole, you might recognize her from Captain Marvel. So I felt like, <laughs> so I, I, felt like I had to ask about well, Captain well, Marvel. Well, Soren is bald. And I do have kind of pointy ears if you look at them. But Soren's ears are a little pointier. But I'm kind of, I have a Vulcan, maybe something in my pants. So. No, absolutely. Well, <laughs> We'll we'll wrap up with Sharon. Thank you so much for coming on Pop Alternative. Thank you. I'm glad we finally made this happen. Yes, the timing is perfect. No, absolutely. We're, so plug away. Where can people follow you on social media? Uh, on social, well, I have the face. There's a Facebook group for Bald is Beautiful. There's yeah. the main website is baldisbeautiful.org. dot o r g baldisbeautiful. dot o r g, mm -hmm. and Instagram, as we mentioned, is at bald. dot is. dot beautiful, and on Facebook there is a Bald is Beautiful. Facebook group page as well. Perfect. And we'll put all that in the description when we uh, post this interview. Awesome. So no, that, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, this has been Poptternative, youtube.com slash Poptternative for previous episodes. And until next time, this is Sharon Blinn and PD Beats signing off. Thank you for tuning in to Poptternative. Make sure to check out our past episodes of Poptternative on YouTube. Be sure to like Poptternative on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been an Autograph Communications production.